Hello and welcome to another episode of Underworld Diary. If you have been enjoying the stories told on this channel feel free to hit the subscribe button below and help the channel grow. On today's episode, we will be covering the story of one of the biggest racketeers in Mafia history, Matty the Horse Yaniello. Matty the Horse is sometimes overshadowed by other large Mafia members of his time, however. He was able to earn an insane amount of money and infiltrate every major industry in New York. Owning over 80 restaurants, sex clubs and bars Matty the Horse pretty much owned Times Square in his time at the top. Not known as the most violent Mafia member of all time, Matty the Horse was able to use his business savvy and connections to build an empire that made the Genovese family the strongest family at the time. Born in 1920, Matty was one of eight children in the Anello family. Said to have a strong connection with his father, Matty would work alongside him at the family-owned restaurant. Learning the ropes of restaurant management, Matty would pick up skills that would be essential for his rise in the Mafia. On top of working with his dad, Matty would be involved in sports throughout his childhood. It was actually during a baseball game as a kid that he earned his nickname Matty the Horse. This happened when during a game, the pitcher on the other team hit Matty with a pitch. Aggravated by this, Matty would charge the mound, attacking the older and bigger kid. It's said that Matty held his own against the bigger kid, with the spectator saying that kid is strong as a horse, birthing the nickname Matty the Horse. This nickname like his reputation would stick with him throughout his youth. Matty reaching his early 20s would work as a longshoreman at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Working here Matty was introduced to the labor industry where he would see an opportunity to make some cash. However this would have to move to the back burner as in 1943 Matty enlisted in the army. During his time in the army, Matty was seen as a good soldier and was awarded a Purple Heart and Bronze Star for Valor for his actions in combat in the Asiatic Pacific Theater. Coming home as the war ended Matty would partner up with his uncle in opening a restaurant. The two were able to open up a restaurant with mixed success. In order to keep the restaurant open and to make some cash for himself, Matty would turn to the streets. In 1951, Matty would be arrested for heroin possession but was able to skate on the charges. This rest is what some believe started Matty's involvement in the underworld. Over the next few years, Matty would start to hang around with members of the Genovese family, building strong connections with key players in the family. Seeing his business mind and his toughness, the family would see potential in Matty and would eventually make him a member of the family in the early 60s. With the backing of the Genovese family, Matty looked to expand his reach and begin building his criminal empire. With guidance from his mentor and sponsor, Funsi Terry, Yanni Ello was able to bolster his business, starting by taking controlling interest in bars, restaurants and clubs throughout the Times Square area. During this time he partnered with a man named Edward L. D. Curtis to open and manage gay nightclubs throughout the area. This partnership allowed Yanni Ello to enter deeper into the growing sex scene in New York. Yanni Ello would own famous clubs at the time including Gilded Grape and Haymarket. Having a hand in pornography, sex clubs and prostitution, Yanni Ello saw money coming pouring in. This money solidified his standing in the family and was seen as a true earner by high-ranking members. On top of his infiltration of the entertainment industry, Yanni Ello also was able to get his hooks into the labor union. Being alleged to be in control of the amalgamated transit union, Yanni Ello would earn extortion money from companies and union members. On top of the money and extortion payment, Yanni Ello had power over all parts of the school busing business in New York through this partnership. These creative endeavors would diversify his crimes, making it harder for law enforcement to connect specific crimes to him. This allowed him to fly under the radar throughout the 60s as he continued to make money and buy up restaurants and clubs throughout the area. However, in 1965, Matty would have his first real interaction with law enforcement when he was called to testify in front of a grand jury. Refusing to testify, the government looked to press charges for contempt but dropped them in 1966. Not being affected by this run-in with the government, Yanni Ello continued building up his businesses, while also adding more insulation between himself and the crimes. Being seen as one of the biggest racketeers in the Mafia, Matty was promoted to the position of Kaporajim in the early 70s. With this new position, Yanni Ello gained more power within the family and was able to further expand his reach throughout New York. Owning over 80 restaurants, nightclubs and bars throughout New York, Yanni Ello was able to not only earn for the family but also was able to provide clean money and places to launder illicit money as well. 
however, one of his restaurants would become publicly known in the year 1972. As in this year, Yanni Ello would be at a restaurant that was on paper owned by Yanilo's father Umberto. The restaurant is named Umberto's Clam House. This now notorious restaurant would be frequented by members of the Mafia. On this day an infamous Mafia member, Joe Gallo would enter the restaurant. Greeting Yanni Ello upon entering the restaurant, Gallo and his group would be given a seat in the back of the restaurant. Sitting there with his family and bodyguard Joe Gallo would be interrupted during his meal. When gunmen rushed into the restaurant opening fire on the table, this resulted in Gallo passing away from his injuries and his bodyguard Diapoulos being hit in the crossfire. It's alleged that during this time Maddie would hide out in the kitchen during this shooting. Ianelio has been alleged to not have been aware of or involved in this hit in any way. However, being in the anger and confusion of the hit it is alleged that Diapoulos, thinking he was set up by Maddie, pointed his gun at Yanni Ello and pulled the trigger. However, in this alleged story, Maddie was unharmed as Diapoulos ran out of bullets during the Earl gunfight and left the restaurant. This brazen hit shook up the Mafia underworld and created a rift between different factions. With this hit taking place in his father's restaurant and the alleged incident, where Maddie could have lost his life, Maddie was enraged and went looking for answers. However, with Diapoulos heading to jail, Maddie was told to focus on his rackets and not cause more violence. Maddie, being as profitable as he was, listened to the advice and continued his operation. Being referred to as the man that owns Times Square, Maddie the horse would send massive amounts of money to the higher up, with the then boss, or what some alleged front boss, Funsi Thierry being a longtime friend and associate of Maddie. He was able to build a strong bond with the leadership of the family. However, Funsi Thierry faced legal trouble in 1980 and passed away in 1981. This was of course a huge loss for Maddie, but was also a loss for the Genovese family overall with Vincent Gigandi being alleged to be the real boss for part. of her for the entirety of Funzi's reign, he would have to look for a new front boss. Gigandi would appoint multiple front bosses over the next years, including Fat Tony Salerno, in order to insulate himself from law enforcement. Gigandi's relationship with Matty was said to be good, as Gigandi liked his earning potential in his relatively low-key status. Eyeing to move up into an administrative position, Matty would have to wait, Moving his way up the family, Maddie and his businesses would be put on hold as in 1985 he would be indicted on charges including racketeering, fraud and extortion. Being caught on wiretap, law enforcement was able to show that he was skimming over to million dollars a year from clubs, bars and restaurants. With a strong case and strong evidence, the government was able to convict Yanni Ello and sentenced him to six years in jail. On top of this, he was ordered to pay a $2 million fine in comparison to the 100-year sentence that some mafiosos were receiving at the time, Maddie was able to get a relatively light sentence. Serving his time Maddie kept a low profile and served his time without much incident. Coming out of jail in 1995 Ianello would be looking to pick up where he left off and go right back into life. However lucky for the ever-ambitious Ianello an opportunity to take a step up would fall right into his lap. re-establishing himself in the family after his prison sentence. Yanni Ello would receive a promotion to leadership when Vincent Gigandi was sent to prison. Wanting to keep the family intact Gigandi set up a committee of high-ranking capos to run the family. This committee was made as a way to confuse law enforcement making it harder to identify the hierarchy of the family. With it being alleged that Gigandi still had the final say from behind bars, the committee would run the family for a few years. However, as members of the committee were arrested over the years, Maddie took over control and became the acting boss of the family in 1998. Being a part of the Mafia for around 50 years, this step up was seen as overdue from members of the family. Moving into this position Yanelo spent the next few years, building the rackets of the family, making more money while trying to fly under the radar. At this time it is alleged that Maddie would receive around $1 million a year in protection fees from Connecticut Waste Management. Getting older in age Maddie looked to slow down in the next few years collecting payments from the rackets while he slowly moved into retirement. However, his plans for retirement were sped up as in 2005, Maddie would be rested on racketeering charges once again. During his rest, it was alleged that the longtime gangster had Godfather 3 playing in the background and asked to do his hair before being taken to prison. Jan Alo would plead guilty to these charges and end up serving 18 months in prison. He would be released at the age of 89 battling cancer and would spend the rest of his time at home with his family. 
He passed away at home in 2012 from a heart ailment associated with cancer. Matted the Horse Yanelo was one of the Mafia's biggest racketeers. Known for starting new businesses and using his business savvy and connections to enter different industries throughout New York. Being involved in late-night clubs and bars he was able to have a controlling interest in a majority of entertainment in Times Square. Rising through the ranks of the Mafia he was able to become the boss of the family in his later years. Achieving these heights through his knack for making money and staying under the radar. Associating with Genevieve's powerhouses like Funzi Thierry and Vincent Giganti. Matty was able to hold a serious sway in one of the most powerful Mafia families of all time. Thank you for watching another episode of Underworld Diary. If you enjoy the stories told on this channel, click the like and subscribe button down below. If you have any topics you'd like to see covered in future videos feel free to leave a comment. If not I will see you next episode with another story from the Underworld.